Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is the second part in our deep dive into the infantry of the Austrian Empire. Now I was told off by a viewer for using the phrase the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the last video as that wasn't used until the middle of the 19th century. So understanding that we'll go with the Austrian Empire from now on. That's how it was known from 1804 before then it was the Holy Roman Empire. So for the majority of our period then we'll be calling it the Austrian Empire. Now we covered a lot in the first video about the makeup of the nation itself and how that impacted the army. So I recommend watching the first video first to put this video in its wider context. But if you're not too fussed about that or you've already seen it, then welcome to part two. Let's jump in. So in this video, I'm going to look at the three types of specialist infantry that the Austrians had and how they were quite different from the line. They're the Jaegers. The Grenzer, which are one of my favourite troop types of the whole Napoleonic Wars. And finally, the Militia, known as the Landwehr. We saw in the last video about how the diversity of the different ethnic groups of the Austrian Empire was something of a major weakness for the army. But in this video, we'll see how it could also be one of its strengths. Due to the massive variety of different groups, each with their own culture, terrain that they grew up in, and their own ideas of you know warfare and how they would conduct themselves when each of these were properly recruited and utilized for their specialist role then these natural advantages could come to the fore lacking the widespread suitability for skirmishing that the basic german or hungarian soldier had was then supplemented by the use of a troop type called jaegers now there was, and there still is, to be honest, a very strong spirit of individualism and hunting in sort of the Austrian area. Uh, right back to the myths of William Tell, particularly in the Tyrol region, which is in the Lower Alps. So it's around about Switzerland where William Tell was, it's that area there. An upcoming Napoleonic Figures video about a chap called Andreas Hofner will go into more depth about the Tyrol and their individuality of spirit. But we'll leave it for now. We'll just be aware that they're very individual thinkers and that they don't like being told what to do. As with many other of early modern warfare innovations, Austria was one of the first proponents of skirmishing and they used them extensively in the Seven Years' War with units called Pandors. That's P-A-N-D-O-U-R. So vital was it that Duffy, in the book that we looked at in the previous video, The Instrument of War, wrote... Quote, the rise of light infantry formed one of the most significant developments in European warfare in the second half of the 18th century, end quote. These Pandors would eventually become the Grenzers, eh, sort of, but it established a strong sense of skirmish warfare in the Austrian army. In spite of this, as General Radetzky, about whom I might end up doing a Napoleonic video, figures video on him as well, actually, he's quite interesting, but he declared of skirmishing, we Austrian generals don't understand this kind of fighting. While General Rosenberg, another Austrian commander, wrote, Austrian troops are not fully prepared and too incapable of helping themselves. They are too used to being in closed lines and acting automatically on the word of command, but they must be capable of relying on their own initiative. End quote. There was just something that was unsuited to the German mindset that the infantrymen had about skirmishing. The small unit tactics being not as comfortable to them as the remorseless drill of the parade square being in that line or that battalion mass with a very defined rule book that they could follow. Even at the time commanders realised that the innate national characteristics for want of a better term of these ethnic groups throughout the Austrian Empire could fill the gap. The skills required to be a good skirmish infantryman were part of the culture of the Tyrolese an Austrian field marshal that fought in the Seven Years' War and then later the Napoleonic Wars, which, to be honest, is, is quite a, a telling comment in of itself. General Deligne, I'm not really sure how that's pronounced, L-I-G-N-E, Line, not sure. Uh, anyway, he wrote, You should not tell a recruit, I will make you into a Jaeger. You must instead take them from the forests. They know how to perch on a rock, how to conceal themselves in one of those fissures which open in the ground after a great drought, or hide behind a mighty oak. They make their way slowly and softly so as not to make any sound, and in such a way they can creep upon a post 
and take it by surprise or shoot down the enemy generals, which is most unsporting of him, but uh, <laughs> there you go. The Jaegers were dressed in grey, and there had actually been experiments in the late 18th century to find what the least conspicuous colour for troops would be, and the one that had run that had won out was a grey called Pike Grey. They wore grey breeches and black gaiters, but during campaign they would sometimes wear loose white or, again, the Pike Grey trousers. They wore large hats, which I, I think, anyway, they were ironically called Corsican hats, with the brim on the left-hand side turned up, which allowed them to actually aim down the sights of their rifle, which is something that wasn't really required by most troops, but when you're skirmishing, it's quite vital. Crossbelts and straps were either black or white, and that makes this unit a super easy one to paint. If you want to go with the grey, with black straps, you can smash out an entire unit in an afternoon, easy. Which makes a nice change for the Austrians, because painting that white is, uh, ugh, is, is not nice. So it's nice to have a unit that you can smash out fairly easily. NCOs and privates wore moustaches, while officers would be clean-shaven. Again, most of the officers would also be from the Tyrol region. Occasionally you might get some German ones in there as well, or potentially some Hungarian ones, but usually they'd be from the region. They'd know their men quite well. The Tyrolese were not subjected to the standard subscription that other areas of Austria were. Now, when I say Austria here, I don't mean Hungary. They had a separate system. This is literally just the German areas of Austria. And instead relied on voluntary recruitment. And there was no real shortage of men eager to serve. The majority of Jaegers were equipped with short muskets, similar to those used by the French light infantry. But the so-called third rank were equipped with rifles. So about a third of the unit would have rifles. Now that said, I don't doubt for a second that many of these lifelong hunters would bring their own civilian rifles and use those. Despite several nations beginning to adopt them, the rifle was still seen very much as a civilian weapon, being accurate but slow to load. Napoleon famously had a demonstration of them, but decided that rifles were not for him and his troops, considering weight of fire preferable to accuracy. Early on, experiments were made to introduce a weapon which would have absolutely revolutionised Napoleonic warfare. It was the, and I'm absolutely going to butcher this word, so, you know, it's a fun German one though, so yeah, I'm going to give it a go anyway. It's the Repeater Windbush 1780. Uh, that's almost certainly not how it's pronounced, but that, that's you know, sort of phonetically how it goes. And this was issued in limited numbers to Jaegers. Now, this was a repeating air rifle that had a 20-shot magazine. Now, <laughs> now there were reliability problems with this. It was obviously a very early prototype, and it was eventually withdrawn. But I think the history of Europe would be completely different if Napoleon's legions came across Austrian skirmishers equipped with repeating rifles. <laughs> I, think, I think it would have been very different. In the early days of the Revolutionary Wars, Austrian skirmishers ruled the battlefield. At Tur Koning in 1794, Tyrolean Jaegers brought, quote, French infantry to despair with accurate rifle fire. Now, I read that the quality... Sorry, that's the end of the quote. Now, I read that the quality of Austrian light infantry dropped off after this very early period, but I wonder if it was a problem of quality or if it was a problem more of quantity, both of the Austrian Jaegers being too few and of French skirmishes being vastly more numerous. In 1805, there were only three Jaeger battalions in the entire army, and this army was the largest, maybe the second largest after the French, uh, possibly the third largest after the Russians, but I, I think you can't really include the entire Russian army. So it's in certainly a large army anyway. It only had three Jaeger battalions. Now, battalions, not regiments. Battalions were considered the ideal compromise when it came to the organisation and deployment of Jaegers. Regiments were seen as being far too cumbersome, even for just organisational purposes and you know, administration. And companies were was too small to be effective. Now, that's an interesting counterpoint to the British, who usually broke their riflemen down into companies and distributed them around the army. By 1812, however, the number of Jaeger battalions had increased to 12, with over half coming from the mountains of the Tyrol, or what is today the Czech Republic and Slovakia, which, again, are very hilly, one could say mountainous, wooded areas. So, again, it's that whole idea of a hunter, which is where, obviously, the word Jaeger comes from. It's German for hunter. 
And it's about this idea of these woodsmen, these guys who go out hunting deer or game for their dinner, using their own rifles, bringing those skills to the battlefield. So why didn't these Jaegers swing the wars in favour of the Austrian Empire? Now, you know, I, I've been saying how great they were. Due to their natural skill and the rifles they were equipped with, accuracy certainly wasn't the problem for them. And I think we can safely say neither was bravery. An example from 1813 saw them carry a fortified position. It's recounted by Nafzinger in his book Napoleon at Dresden. He says, quote, The Jaegers moved through a hail of bullets and canister fire and leapt into the ditch. They pressed up against the palisade, tearing it down and climbing over and into the redoubt. After a hot bayonet fight, the French were defeated and fled into the hospital gardens. End quote. And in this action, as well as seizing a fortified position in the middle of the French line, well, maybe not in the middle, off to the side of the French line, they also seized six cannon as well, and it allowed the Austrians a staging point for their, their next phase of their attacks. So the problem wasn't accuracy with the Jaegers, and it wasn't bravery. So could it have been training? After all, you know, these men were used to fighting individually or in pairs. I've talked about how independent-minded they were, and compared that with the Austrian line, who were superbly well-trained. Well, no, it doesn't seem to have been training either. An example at Leipzig in 1813 was that during the general advance of the Allies, suddenly French cavalry appeared, menacing the 5th Jaeger Battalion. They quickly formed square at the run, before delivering a volley at the French cavalry, and waiting in square, bayonets at the ready. Now, for them to move in skirmish formation, and then with no loss of pace to form square, absolutely incredible. I think I can't think of any uh, other army that could have done that. Maybe the British, maybe... I ooh, I don't know. Maybe uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't rely on it anyway. So no, it wasn't bravery, it wasn't accuracy, and it wasn't skill. I think it comes down to purely numbers. A Jaeger battalion in the field had about four hundred men, and that's less of a third that of a line battalion. As skilled as these men were, there simply wasn't enough of them to make an impact. If you throw out a skirmish line, so they're about a third of a battalion. So you can cover one battalion with them. Now you've only got three battalions of Jaegers in the entire army. Twelve if we're looking uh, much later with the uh, the invasion of Russia. So you can cover twelve battalions of infantry. Well, that's, that's not really going to go far when you're fighting the Battle of Dresden or another of those massive post-1812 battles. One of the problems was that as those battles grew in size, the proportion of Jaegers whilst going up, still stayed the same because those battles were so much larger. British riflemen, although in companies, they were distributed out across the whole army, so wherever they were on the battlefield, they could have an impact, and they were backed up by the absolutely fearsome firepower of the British in line. And I think that's a huge point there. The Jaegers were skirmishing ahead of Austrian line infantry units, and they couldn't necessarily exploit any... Uh, tactical breakthroughs that the Jaegers made, maybe small-scale ones, because they were so wedded to that drill book, they didn't quite have the initiative to take advantage of local battlefield conditions. The French, on the other hand, they had absolutely just swarms of skirmishes. Uh, if we, again, I mentioned it in the line uh, video, if you think about a French battalion, one in six of its men is a skirmisher, and that's not including... Uh, the fact that these line regiments, or line battalions rather, could just break down into you know six, seven, eight hundred skirmishes in one go. So, yeah, I, I think it was mainly a problem of numbers. I also think as well that they were misused by their Austrian commanders as well. As we saw earlier on, there was a feeling that Austrian generals didn't really know how to get the best out of their skirmishing troops. They much were much more at home with troops in solid lines and that leads us to the second troop type i want to talk to you about today which is the grenzer now to help alleviate this lack of skirmishing skilled troops austrian high command moved several units from their southern border which were in today's balkans to fight in the west during peacetime these grenzer regiments would guard the frontier of the ottoman empire for seven months of the year the other five being far too poor conditions for campaigning the ottomans in particular 
they did not like to go out when it was cold and damp and rainy. That they, they very much liked campaigning in in the best conditions that they could. In wartime, one battalion of each regiment was left in place on the border, with the other battalion, sometimes two battalions, joining the regular army and were part of the highly regarded advance guards. Because of their semi-militia status, some of the regiments of Grenza would have two battalions, some would have three, depending on local populations, distance to the actual borderline, how many people felt strongly about the Ottoman presence, things like that. Because they were on this border, there would be what today would be referred to as constant friction. That's very small-scale fights, you know, half a dozen guys here, a dozen guys there, a raid on a village to capture some goats or, you know, whatever, that, that sort of thing. It would be almost constant warfare. Every day there would be a little incident going off that would, you know, it really honed these men down. And it meant that effectively the entire male adult population of the Balkans were militarised. And even, you know, a man of 20 years old would have been engaged in this kind of warfare for years, maybe five, six, seven, eight years perhaps. Units were a mix of Catholic and Orthodox Christians, and so many considered themselves to be the guardians of Christendom itself. While we've not really covered the Ottomans a huge amount on this channel, and I hope that'll change, I hope to do more videos on the Ottomans later. In fighting the small-scale wars with the Russians and Austrians on that borderline, their light troops, the so-called Bashi Basuks, who were usually Albanians or Northern Greek Macedonians, were very good skirmishers themselves. And fighting these tough, merciless mountain men, Grenza either got good or they died in the attempt. In spite of the combat experience, and due to some occurrences in western battlefields where I think they were misused as just regular line battalions, most rules writers, I think, get them wrong. I think they would be classed as maybe superior militia. They're normally treated as worse than line, so sort of D-class if we're going to go for a... D a um, WRG, sorry, I forgot the name of them there, uh, type classification. And I think that's a little unfair. I, I think they deserve to be better than that. Uh, I'm going to discuss the rules a bit uh, more clearly later on, so I'll leave that for now. But, um, yeah, no, I just think that it doesn't really demonstrate them very well in most rule sets. Now, Grenzers fought as a mixture of formed and light infantry, Whilst unsuited to taking their place in the line alongside German or Hungarian units, not being as stoic as the Germans or as perhaps hot-blooded as the Hungarians, they were very much suited to scouting and skirmishing, fulfilling a role the rest of the army were noticeably terrible at. Now we can exclude the Jaegers from that, but as we've seen there's only 5 or 12 battalions of those. I think they might have had 9 in 1809. So between 3 and 12 battalions across the whole army, Everyone else, not great at skirmishing. In fact, I think in the Black Powder rules, they have poor mixed formation. I'm fairly sure they do. Um, contrasting the numbers, uh, Jaegers, who only had three battalions in 1805, the Grenzer mustered 18 regiments, each of two field battalions, with some having a third depot battalion. Now, if we say that they were all just, just two battalions, and we know there were some more of that, one of them had to be left guarding the border, so we can halve the number. So we're still looking at nine Grenzer battalions as opposed to just three of the Jaegers. Also, Grenzer battalions were pretty big as well. We're looking around about the same size as an Austrian line battalion. Certainly a thousand men plus, I'd be expecting. So, yep, yeah, you know, you're looking again maybe, what, nine times the number of Grenzer as there are Jaegers. So that's, that's quite a few. As we've seen in other videos, many regiments of different nations often had a battalion that was used to train men, and occasionally uh, these Grenzer units would have one of those back home, the Depot Battalion. The Grenzer really show off the different mindsets of the military command of Austria and France, and what they had at the time. Lacking formally issued weapons, smart white, white uniforms, rigorous drill, many Austrian generals came to regard them as little more than semi-trained peasants. As we know, however, many Austrian generals were incompetent morons, and they couldn't see that these weren't Austria's finest troops despite their lack of spit, polish, and formal training. They were their best troops exactly because of the lack of those things. The French, who had a little time for such foppery, certainly in their, their combat arms, 
regarded them very highly as fellow warriors, considering them the only warlike troops in the entire Austrian army. Napoleon had absolutely no hesitation of using these, quote, uncivilized men, and after the defeat of Austria in 1809, she ceded some territories and six Grenzer regiments. The 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 10th and 11th went into French service, where they served until 1814. Duffy says in his book on the Austrian army, Instrument of War, and I think it's a really good way of summing them up, Far from being passive conscript hordes, the Grenzer had a lively sense of their dignity and what was due to them, and in this respect they may be compared with the yeoman archers of late medieval England." End quote. Despite the low opinion of Austrian commanders, they performed quite well in combat. During the retreat after Marengo in 1800, the army was in full flight. Two battalions of Grenzer, and I'm going to apologise for the pronunciation here, two battalions of Grenzer, the Varasidin Krutz and Otto Kack fended off all attacks and allowed the Grenadier battalions to march to the Bormida. So, as we saw in the Grenadiers uh, video in the last one, they were considered to be the elite reserve. So, saving them, super important. And it allowed them to join with the Grenadiers and fight one last rearguard action in the campaign to stop the complete destruction of the Austrian army. After another disaster for the Austrian army, Austerlitz, the Grenzers fought hard even after the majority of the army had broken and ended the battle suffering 66% casualties. Goetz, in his book Austerlitz, describes such a vicious engagement quite well. Now, this is quite a long quote, so we'll start it here. Quote, The village of Telnitz was a very strong position. There were vineyards, a ditch, the garden walls and two rows of houses. It was defended by the 3rd Line Regiment of General Legrand's division. The narrow space between the Goldback Stream and the Sachin Pond offered a very limited frontage to the Grenzers, who were the attackers. At 7am, the fighting began. General Kienmeyer sent forward the 2nd Battalion of the 2nd Zeckler Grenz Regiment, approximately 500 bayonets. Now, the Zeckler Grenz were from Wallachia, which is Transylvania, so the former area of Vlad the Impaler and all that stuff. So that's the sort of image that you can have. So back to the quote anyway. Under Major de Vecchi to, and this is him quoting, to sweep the French skirmishers from the vineyards. He then continues, the Grenza marched over the hill with band playing. The companies of French voltigeurs fired at them and fell back to the vineyards, joining the rest of their battalion. The Grenzers continued their advance until the musket fire from the vineyards halted them. This musket fire was intense, and because the Grenza were in the open, they suffered much heavier casualties than the French. The Grenzers fell back. Key and Mayer ordered the 1st Battalion, the 2nd Zeckler, to support their 2nd Battalion in a fresh effort. Three remaining Grenzer Battalions were kept in reserve. Now the attackers penetrated nearly to the foot of the hill, at the open space between the vineyards and Telnitz. The French veterans lining the ditch counter-attacked and drove them back. The Grenzers rallied and attacked for a third time. The French withdrew from the vineyards, but made the Austrians pay dearly for their success. The two battalions of Grenzer swept through the vineyards and finally took the ditch but the French held Telnitz and its bridges over the Goldback stream. Keen Mayer replaced the two battalions, having suffered almost 50% losses, with three battalions of fresh Grenzer. At 8am, the three battalions attacked Telnitz, but without success. The French pursued them until the vineyards. Key and Mayer rallied the three battalions, and with the two battalions of 2nd Zeckler counter-attacked. The Austrians took the ditch again, but both sides were equally exhausted and stayed where they were. Key and Mayer reported the situation to his superior, and received support of Russian infantry, the Russian 7th Jaeger, and two battalions of the Grenzer attacked with a cheer and poured into Telnitz. They also took a bridge over the Goldback stream, end quote. Now that was quite a long quote there, but I included it because I think it really shows the diversity of combat roles the Grenzer could have. They fought in skirmish formation throughout the vineyard, skirmishing with the French voltigeurs, until they fell back to their main line battalion. They then traded fire as two lines. Now, the Grenzer came off worse from this, but they fell back, and then they were able to attack through the vineyards again and then form an attack formation, storming the first a ditch, and then later with the Russian Jaegers, storming the bridge as well. Now, there's something that also came through here that I thought was quite interesting. I'm not sure I talked about it in the last video, and that's one aspect that stands out time and again is the willingness of Austrian and Hungarian units to reform and have another go. 
however badly mauled they'd been previously. It happened at Asper and Essling. I think I mentioned it in that video, and it happened in this quote from Austerlitz as well. It was late in the wars, though, that perhaps saw their greatest battle. On the 12th of September 1813, Prince Eugene took the Italian Guard, two battalions of Italian light infantry, two squadrons of Italian dragoons, and a horse battery, and advanced on Samarje. Under the Austrian commander, Oberst Milutinovich, were six companies of Gradishkana Grenzer, two companies of St. Georgia Grenzer, a half squadron of hussars, and two three pounder light cannons. Eugene sent one battalion to turn the Austrian left and one battalion against the Austrian's right flank. In the centre, after a short firefight, the Austrian skirmishers, which were half a company of Grenzer sharpshooters, were driven in by the Italian counterparts. Soon, one battalion of the Italian guard appeared on the Austrian flank, and Oberst Milutinovich detached one and a half companies to face them. The Grenzer delivered a volley and immediately attacked with cold steel. Although Milutinovich was wounded, his Grenzers drove the guardsmen off. We saw in that example again another way that Grenzer would operate. They'd separate a large number of their strength out as skirmishers, and this would allow them a firm footing to withdraw if necessary, for instance in the face of cavalry. Their skill would allow a lot of them to face their enemies in open order, and also to quickly react to any of the enemy's manoeuvres as well. We saw the Italian guard move around the flank, and with but an order, Milutinovich was able to detach one and a half battalions of his men to turn to face him. And it's interesting, he was able to do that with half a battalion. I've said before in many videos that a battalion is the basic tactical unit of the Napoleonic battlefield. Occasionally you'll have companies, things like British riflemen, as we talked about before, but for him to be able to separate a battalion into two halves like that really, really shows the the level of skill to the lower levels that the Grenzer had. And normally you only see that skill with the NCOs, with the junior officers, in those units that are designed for skirmish fighting, for that more individualistic form of combat. As with the Jaeger, Grenzer were equipped with a variety of weapons, some issued, some the soldiers' own property. Until 1808, sharpshooters were equipped with rifles, or this sort of like weird over-under weapon, which looks like, kind of like a bit like a shotgun. Uh, the rest of the units had muskets. This experimental weapon was too cumbersome, however. It was carried in a bag, which made it very slow to prepare to fire. And after 1808, it was replaced by regular rifles and carbines. Uniform-wise, as perhaps befits these sort of roguish border men, there was a little bit of variation. All regiments wore tight blue breeches in the Hungarian style, but different regiments had different coloured coats. White in ten regiments, brown in seven. And straps could either be black or white. It, it didn't necessarily depend on the colour of the coats. There were brown-coated units with black straps and white straps, and same with the white ones as well. Again, we'll look later at how they were portrayed in black powder. I talked earlier on about how I think they're misunderstood by a lot of rules writers. But, you know, spoiler alert, I actually think black powder does a superb job of portraying them. But we'll look at that later. Before we get to that, and finally in this video, I want to discuss the, the actual militia. We've discussed the Grenzer, the sort of pseudo-militia. This is the actual Austrian militia, the Landwehr. Formed in June 1808, it was a key part in Austria gearing up for her war with France. It was estimated that Austria could raise 180,000 Landwehr and Hungary 50,000. The numbers, however, were never attained, with the Hungarian Diets, that was their semi-independent parliament, refusing to sanction the raising of the Landwehr. And it was also thought too dangerous to raise it in Galicia, where there was a large Polish population, and it was believed, correctly as it turns out, that they were disaffected, giving a load of disaffected guys guns, probably not the best idea. But they did manage to raise 170 Landwehr battalions. Some had four Fusilier companies, some had six. They also had Jaeger companies as well. Now, don't be fooled. These were these were not great. They were very, very second-class units. Third-class, one could say. These units, they trained on Sundays, and they had an annual three-week camp as well, which <laughs> someone who served at the TA actually really made me chuckle because it's, it's very similar to how they trained when I was in. It might be different now, I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> when war was declared in April 1809, many of the Langevier battalions had not 
quite been raised yet, but their main use anyway was to provide garrison and internal security, thus releasing many regulars for duty on campaign. Each Austrian man, aged 21 to 32, had to serve one year of an unpaid term, in which they had to pay for their own equipment. They would, however, get food and lodgings, which, to be honest, when you're living in that agrarian culture that a lot of Austria would have been, it's probably not too horrendous a trade-off, if I'm honest. The uniform was vastly different to the rest of the army, having each man dressed in a uniform based almost on local attire. There were some uh, standardization, particularly in 1813, but largely it was you know what you could get hold of in your local region. One of the most common that I've seen is a blue-gray coat and quite a wide-brimmed hat. The uniform was considered more comfortable than regular infantry, and it was easier to move around in, because basically it was civilian wear. Some land via units were used in the field army, however, but it had unsurprisingly terrible results. Out of the 12,200 land via in Upper Austria, in 1809, it is said that up to three quarters deserted upon the approach of the French. So, not great. The French army, having smashed the Austrians at Wagram, uh, occupied Austria, and in May, Napoleon decreed the demobilization of them. When the struggle of Napoleon was resumed in 1813, the Landwehr was reformed, and this time it was done a lot more formally. More uniforms were issued, and some of the Landwehr were paired with line parent line regiments. Again, very similar to how the British TA works now, or again, you know, used to 15, 20 years ago. Again, the Landwehr, in this situation, almost next to useless. They were a pretty good source of manpower to feed into the line units, but when they took to the field in of themselves, absolutely not great. But they're a fun unit. They look quite nice on the tabletop. That blue-gray is quite a nice colour. A lot of them wore brown uniforms as well. So they're, they're a nice change from painting white. I've got at least one battalion of Landwehr. I think I might have two battalions of Landwehr. Uh, they're, they're just cool. They're, they're just nice, different figures. So that's a very, very brief covering off of the Landwehr. There's not a huge more amount to say about them. I try and get... A battlefield success or two as an example of they, how, how they can be good but uh, I couldn't find any for Lanvier, I'm afraid so with that we've looked at all the the three different types of fairly odd boar units the Austrian army had so how are they portrayed by black powder well overall I would say very very well I think I think it's one of the massive strengths of that system is that it's really good at incorporating these unusual units because the specialist units didn't really change throughout the wars, they, they had almost those innate characteristics that stayed with them the whole way through. I think we can look at the rules presented in the 1812 book in Clash of Eagles and apply them from the 1790s onwards. Another thing that would really change is the quality of the generals commanding them and the quantity of the battalions you've got on the table. The easiest to discuss is probably the Landveer, although they don't have rules in uh, Clash of Eagles. So I think it's just following a pattern of other poor quality militia. I would give them the stats of the Russian Opolcheni. Uh, they're in the same book. I'd probably give them freshly raised, though, uh, just as an extra additional. I mean, you could say that they re-roll sixes for shooting or something like that, but I, th I think freshly raised would be fair enough. Maybe re-roll a six on that chart, actually. I'll think about it. I don't know. I'm not sure. But um, I, I don't think it's really quite. I think freshly raised is a, is a pretty good rule. I think it d demonstrates them quite well. Uh, next up, Jaegers. Uh, now, they're very similar to British riflemen in the rules. Not as good, though. And I think that's fair enough. Jaegers, for all their independent spirit, they were not quite as individualistic, I think, as British riflemen. And I think that, that translates into them not being quite as good. So I think while riflemen get elite... The Jaegers don't, and that seems reasonable to me. Additionally, they were still quite tightly controlled by their officers. The manual states that an officer should be positioned every 50 metres in a Jaeger skirmish screen, whereas the British rifles, they were quite a bit further apart than that. So, you know, I think that's fair enough. The, the idea of the elite rule is that individual thought of the soldiers, and I don't really think that it would suit the Jaegers that much. We saw that they were more than happy to mix it up in close combat as well, so I think they should be able to form skirmish, but they should also be a lion unit as well. 
maybe not quite as good as a lion unit. I'm not really sure how you could um, you could do that. Maybe don't give them sharpshooters. They could also be a mixed rifle formation as well, which, which is what they are. And I, I think that's perfect for that, really. They're a difficult unit to come with, but I think mixed rifle formation, now I think on it a bit more, that's probably the perfect rule for them. In fact, you could argue it would almost have been written for them. If you wanted to include the early repeating rifle, how could you do that, I guess? You could maybe add an extra dice for firing, but that dice has to re-roll any successful hits. Maybe it re-rolls sixes, something like that, or a six doesn't cause disorder. Uh, just to just to get across that, it gives you extra firepower, but it's not as reliable as regular short muskets or rifles would be. Uh, or, or just leave it out altogether. Use it in skirmish games only, a bit like the knock gun. Uh, just, it just, yeah, I'm, I'll let you decide that one. I don't really have any hard and fast rules about the repeating rifle. Just try not to make it too good. Don't give them, like, the stats from a, uh, a, a Remington rifle or something like that. I think that might be taking it a little bit too far. So, yeah, no, I think that's fine. That's the Jaegers. I might have said Grenzers in that last bit. I didn't mean to. That was all about the Jaegers. So what about the Grenzers, though? Well, this is where I think Black Powder really shines. Mixed Rifle Formation is absolutely written for the Grenzers. They can form line and attack the enemy. They can be skirmishing. They can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, I don't think they should be too keen on charging the enemy, though. So my thought would be, don't give them lax initiative, like the Russians have. Keep that, but they can't charge on initiative. They're more, far more likely to start a firefight, maybe break out into skirmishes. So you can still do stuff within initiative range of the enemy, but you can't charge them. You'd have to be ordered to do that. I'd also be tempted to give them Elite 5 Plus as well. Now that's just me, that's perhaps my bias coming through there. But I do really think the Grenzers had that independent spirit. And it would also help separate them from the Jaegers, I think, as well. I'd also give them Tough Fighters, you know what I mean? In fact, I think they've actually got Tough Fighter already. In fact, I'm fairly sure they've got Tough Fighters. So it's not just me this time, they actually legitimately have it. So that's it for the Austrian Specialist Infantry. Now, I will be doing another video on Cavalry. I've started already. It looks like it might end up being two videos. And I'll probably do one on the Artillery as well, actually. Austrian Artillery is quite an interesting topic. I did get a request from the last video. And it's something that I didn't cover. And the reason I didn't cover it is because I completely forgot to. So it's, it's fair enough. Well done for making it all the way to the end of this video. Your reward is a special bonus round on... Austrian standards. Now, there were three different patterns of flag carried throughout the Napoleonic period. There's the 1792 pattern, the 1804, and the 1806 patterns. Now, I'm going to be absolutely honest. I've had a look at them. I can't really see there's a huge amount of difference between any of them. They all look pretty much the same to me. But there is two different kinds of standards. So it's very similar to the Russians. From 1768 until 1805, each infantry regiment would carry two flags per battalion. The first, or Lieb battalion, carried the white Liebfahn and one yellow Ordin Afan. So I'm really sorry, I've almost certainly butchered those. But one's the white flag with uh, Maria Theresa on the back, and the other one's the yellow flag with the diamonds all around the border with the double headed eagle on. I'm going to put some images up on the screen during this video, including. A picture of a f Austrian flag I took recently on my holiday to Berlin. So it's very similar to the way the Russians saw. What would happen is the first battalion would carry a white one and a yellow one, and then the second battalion would carry two of the yellow ones. As the org new organization was implemented under General Karl Mack von Lieberich, an imperial decree of the 22nd of June 1805 reduced the flags to one per battalion. The Grenadier, or Lieb Battalion, would carry the white one, as it was the senior battalion, and the others would carry one yellow flag each. When the army reverted to its former organisation on the 6th of December 1806, so did the flags. That's to say the Liebfahn plus one Ord Ordinafahn for the 1st battalion, two Ordinafahns for the others. A further change in 1808 reduced the number of flags to one per battalion. So for the war gamer, that means that if you're doing anything up to... Just before Austerlitz, you should have the one white, one yellow, first battalion, two yellows, and second battalion. If you're doing Austerlitz, then you should just have one per battalion, 
with the 1st Battalion carrying a white one, or the Grenadier one, the Grenadier combined carrying a white one, and then the other battalions carrying one yellow one. Or if you're doing the Danube campaign or later, it should be the same thing as well. So it should be one white one or one yellow one. Now, my Grenadiers carry a yellow one. They should really be carrying the white one. But for me, the yellow one is more evocative of Austria. That, for me, is the flag of Austria. So I decided to give them the yellow flag. I think, to be honest, because they were combined Grenadiers, they didn't have formal standards anyway. Very much like combined Russian battalions. Just give them whatever flag you want. A Grenadier is the biggest, toughest guys in the regiment. If they want the white flag, they're going to get the white flag. If they want the yellow one, they're going to get the yellow one. Now, the white is the more prestigious, but I can say that for whatever reason, my Grenadier Colonel, he came up through the ranks of the 2nd Battalion of his regiment, so he prefers the yellow one. Whatever, you can make your own story up. That's the one that I just made up off the top of my head. Now, I think that's basically it for this video on specialist Austrian infantry. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. This has been quite a long one. I'm also going to start a new series. I'm going to start with the Austrians, and it's going to be on starting the army from a buying and gaming perspective. So keep an eye out for that one, in addition to the one, perhaps two Austrian cavalry ones, and I will see you soon. Hope you're all keeping safe at this time, and I'll be back hopefully on Sunday with another video. I'm going to try and up my content production. So thank you very much. Goodbye.